Hello, my name is Shane A. Bassett, your host, the movie analyst, and my guest today is a director. We haven't crossed paths, but I have seen his work, uh, a couple of different productions, and this new one, uh, Lady Terror. I guarantee you're going to enjoy it. It's an independent Australian film, which I love to support, and Nathan joins me now. G'day, Nathan, from Sydney. <laughs> G'day, Shane. Uh I'm really glad we're talking because as we've talked off the record, I'm an advocate for Australian films and, and independent movies and supporting filmmakers, actors, no matter what level. So it's good to see this movie out there and I'm sure you put a lot of work behind it. Oh man, thanks so much. It's great to be able to extend the reach to you know things like uh, uh, Google Play, um, Apple TV, uh, a lot of stuff's popping up on Tubi, Voodoo, Prime, yeah. US, US uh, UK. So, you know, streaming, uh, you know, well and underway. But as you know, I'm the Renaissance man, so I always author a Blu-ray and a DVD for online sales. Good. I absolutely adore physical media like most people, well, I think most people still do in general in our business. And, and yeah. I think it's important to keep physical media going. Yeah, I think, you know, film connoisseurs and for myself, like just to have it in your hand, if that's what you grew up with and you're used to, it's hard to let it go. But there's, yeah. still, such a, there's still such a cult frenzy and market for it and even collectibles. I mean, I just saw Arrow put out the new Bruce Lee um, box set. You know, collectors are going to buy it. There might only be 800 copies and then it actually appreciates in value. Uh, yep. Monst, my friend, my friends at Monster Fest, you know, they continually um, support me in this kind of endeavor. Uh, Jarrett's from Monster is actually in the middle of trying to put out a Revenge of the Guilo VHS, <laughs> if you can believe that. Oh, how cool! I mean, um, I saw Jarrett's name in the credits, so yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, we're good friends. And can I just say, I've just noticed up in your wall of fame, you've got my favorite movie in the background. The Lost Boys or oh, Escape yeah, from New York? <laughs> it's my favourite film. That That is an original. That Lost Boys, that's cardboard, it's double-sided, and it was hanging in a cinema in 1987 oh. when it came out. I think it was 87. Uh, oh, my God. It was a village cinema that doesn't exist anymore where I live, up on the central coast of New South yep. Wales. And yeah. I've had it, and it, I can't believe it's still a little rough around the edges, but I've kept it in good condition. My friend, Thanks. you know, when I one of my first jobs was working in a movie warehouse, and it was when Lost Boys came out, and I remember them saying, "Oh, go and help yourself to the posters." And there was a, there was, you know, it must have been this thick, high, and I took a whole bunch of them. I used to cut out the black and white around the edges, and I had I had a you know montage in my bedroom with exactly what you're talking about. So that's beautiful. Uh, we were of a similar vintage then, and yeah. I know that I was. Um, I used to cut out the ads in the newspapers and everything. Yeah, and the same, <laughs> same. <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, was Lady Terror ten years in the making, or was it like no, a eight day shoot or something? Yeah, not at all. It was um, sort of you know city of pants, kind of you know hot to trot. Let's go get them, sort of sort of vehicle, but. Uh, on ice because we hit the lockdown. We didn't know when we were going to come out. And I think there was a three month break between the two lockdowns and I shot then. Yeah. Everyone thought everyone thought I was mad, but I said, we've got to do it because I, I don't know how long this thing's going to go on for, but also it gave me something to do in the second lockdown so I could edit, you know. Oh, yeah. Because you're based yeah. around Melbourne, right? Yeah, predominantly. And, and, and uh, we got it bad. I mean, we got it bad. Other places, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, it was the 10th feature film that I had directed, uh, but probably a year in prep. You know, normally I'll spend a year um, in the writing, co writing to get it right. I don't want to just sort of bang it out tonight and shoot tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> spend a year, a year in pre, you know, particularly with this development of the script to make sure it's just hitting the um the notes that uh, encapsulate my genre my you know my uh, my stamp yeah, yeah. Uh, what about writing on set did you change anything up as you left? not so much on this one because because of those time frames because we're all kind of scared that we we're going to go on a lockdown or we didn't know whether we'd be cut off halfway through shoot so we just kind of went in and executed it and that uh a lot of thanks to um my DOP camera assist, so um, Deer and Dan, 
um, right. without them, without them knowing my previous styles and having worked together, we wouldn't have been able to pull it off the way we did. I don't think. What about directing yourself? Is there, <laughs> is there Mate, are there advantages or disadvantages? And yeah, that must be tricky you, at times. You'll find that it becomes more exhausting, kind of the further into it you get. Um, so you get, you know, if I if I um, if I'm having a tough shoot, it can be really grueling. And mm. some days you'll wake up and say, God, why am I doing this to myself? It's like all my self-torture. Um, but look, to be truthful, the, the simple answer is I've been doing it since I was a kid. You know, when yeah, I okay. first picked up the video camera, I would shoot, act, direct, edit in camera, put it on for the family and friends. You know, I've been doing this my whole life. So I don't, I don't really see it as a bit of, as, as too much of a stretch. Some people think it's it's ridiculous or it's too hard, but as I've discovered over the years, there's a lot of directors and actors I know that that do it, you know, and it's the new thing. The, the irony to it is that if you look at a film like Creed 3, where Michael yeah. B. Jordan's now directing himself, it's now it's now more normal. But the thing is, if everybody's on TikTok and everybody's essentially directing themselves every day on social media, pretty much. then a feature film, is really just an extension of what everyone's doing now anyway. That's how I look at it. It's only a matter of time before we have our first TikTok movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> it actually wouldn't be a bad idea. There was a platform, I don't know if you've heard of Star Now, which is mm. online. It's kind of like it's kind of like an online database where you, you you put yourself out there. It's like a notice board and you say, hey, I want to act and keep right. creative can can kind of um, get together and it when star now originated about probably 10 could even be 15 years ago they approached me and they said oh we're going to finance our first feature and we want you to direct it <laughs> and i thought oh this is great it would be the first star now feature but uh unfortunately uh funding fell through as it happens oh, yeah <laughs> funding must be one of the hardest parts about making a movie um was lady sarah any easier for you Oh, look, I've been in the game for so long. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty spoiled because if I want to make an independent film, it's not very hard thing me, for me to, to attempt because I've been, I've been around so long and been a rock. I've got access to so many people and, sure. and facilities. It's more about the casting and the money is more about post-production because, as we know, sound mix is nothing, is never cheap. No. Uh, the, the money kind of kicks in more in the post. Uh, and I do find... I was saying in an interview the other day, if it's if it's under five hundred thousand, it doesn't matter if you spend one thousand, two, ten, or a hundred; it's in the same cesspool. Right. So the thing I think the trick is to not be stupid about it. Like if it, it is what it is, and also um, uh, know where it's going to end up. Like for example, I didn't make this for IMAX. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So you know, if I'm making it strictly for Prime. Uh, I'm already kind of in a, in, a, in a realm where, you know, it's low budget. I don't have to stress too much, you know, so it kind of it is what it is. And I don't know, I had friends in film school that would say, oh, you know, don't do it that way, you know, spend 10 years and make one film. And I said, I don't want to waste 10 years. I don't know if I've got 10 years. I want to make 10 films. You know, it's like <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather be doing it and learning the different genres and meeting people. And when you're doing it, that's when you're learning, not when you're sitting back waiting for the money. I don't think, right, I don't yeah. think you're learning then, you know. Was it always going to be called Lady Terror? Did you have other titles yeah. in mind? And I only say that because... Jake Large, lawyer. Oh, yeah. Love. That yeah. rings the bell. Yeah. Um, I guess that was a bit tongue in cheek, you know, the fact that he was a lawyer. Um, <laughs> he was, you know, and, and I think it's more of an American slang, isn't it? You know, when when they say, hey, you know, I'm too large, and we would say we're 2K, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it was a bit of a pun there. Uh, but yeah, Lady Terror, probably that's a really great question. No one's asked that yet. I, I think because originally I thought it would be Grindhouse, I was probably thinking of Planet Terror. Yeah, sure. And, okay. and, because, it, and because it was Basic Instinct-esque, I thought, yes. okay, so it's the woman and then it's the terror. It's the woman and the grind. Okay, it's Lady Terror. And I looked it up and I thought, there's no film with this title. I was like, boom, there you go. That's there's great, yeah. Often, you, know, you come up with a title and it's been taken and you, you don't want that. No. There's too many movies these days. Well, it's been happening for a long time where they've got the same title. It, yes, and there's no shame in it sometimes. Yeah. Even, even a couple of years between, it should be like racehorses because racehorses can't be called the same thing. Uh, yeah. 
over a period of time. It should be like that with movies, I think. Come up with something else. The other interesting thing is that the movie's heavily inspired by Corey Hank, Corey Feldman's Blown Away. But because of the Jeff Bridges Blown Away, it actually yes. is very hard to find. So that yes. was, yeah, that, that annoyed me that they called it that because... You, uh, it's just it becomes harder for people to to uh, to access it. Yeah, no, to you um put Corey's uh, the names Corey's in your credits as a dedication. So yes, yeah, that was yes. interesting. Yeah, because I think if you, if you watched Blown Away and then you watched Lady Terry, you definitely would see the similarities. Mm. It's heavily influenced and dedicated because I don't know if you if you if you'd seen or read before, but I had Haim attached to a film a long time ago and then he okay. passed away. So right. we kind no, of I didn't yeah, know. yeah, I had him attached to a horror film that I'd written and it was very it was devastating. So it mm. kind of stayed with me. So the fact that um I want I think probably because it was my tenth, I felt like this is a big number. I mm. wanted to do something special and pay homage um, mm. and also kind of reminisce. Uh, about him and also because I had a lost opportunity I wanted to make a film I kind of you know in dedicated to him yeah mm. well that's a coincidence then because I usually change that up so I can't believe it I thought that was intentional I thought you knew that was my favorite film that's incredible no I, I remember Corey in the credits but um it just I know I watched your movie over a week ago now so um that's a coincidence but I'm really stoked well, it's part, part of our well, interview while you're there <laughs> I just happened to have the oh, original VHS right here. It's awesome, mate. We'll start Check swapping out the one. VHS stories one day, probably. That one looks like that one looks like a video easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, hang on to it. That's all I can say. And obviously, you Unreal. must have a bit of a collection. Oh God, yeah. I've got. A, I've just put up a, po a picture on social media. I've got the Lost Boys in every format. So we're talking like video age, PSP, Laserdisc, wow. all the way up to to 4K. I've got it in every single format that's ever existed. It was like the best movie I'd ever seen when I was. Yeah, kid. I'm ever. so glad that you like it, man. I, I like you even more now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I'm not going to fish it out, but in front of me here is my soundtrack collection, and the Lost oh. Boys soundtrack on vinyl oh. is right there. Okay. Too. If I if I if I go through my my shelf here, it, it's 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 almost all Lost Boys. <laughs> well, we'll have to have a beer and talk Lost Boys one day. I love it. In fact, while you're there, oh yes, please more. Well, that's the Beta. That's the Beta Max. Unbelievable. And it's Beta still Max, in. But and it's still in shrink wrap. Can you believe it? You know what? I can believe it because who had beta? I mean, it was a thing yeah. for a little while, but True. I worked in a video shop and they didn't really rent. Yeah, that was the crazy thing because, remember, beta was actually superior quality. And I remember when I started working out in, 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 in for Channel 9 as a camera assistant, it was, and it was all um, beta cam, beta cam yeah. SP. So, I, and I knew, oh, that's right, because beta was a superior format, but people couldn't um, afford it because it was more expensive, remember, when it first came out. Yeah, yeah. And um, mm. it's funny you say that because I know television stations, not that I worked at one, but um, used Beta Max for a long time. Yeah. Way, you know, way longer than anyone else, apparently. Yeah. And it does it does outlast VHS. Um, and I think because it's, uh, I guess, because it's a smaller cassette. Oh, though then again, the ribbon, I think, is the same size. Yeah. I don't know. I need to check into that. I think the ribbon's the same size. I'm not sure. Whether the tape, maybe it's the tape cassette size that's reduced. I, I, I can't even remember. Well, the cassette side is smaller than B, um, than VHS, but I'm not sure of the mm. tech, tech side of it. Yeah, I can't remember. But um, but yeah, it was definitely uh, a superior format, but just didn't last. But that that's domestication for you, isn't it? Because <laughs> if VHS was cheaper, that's what everyone would have gone for. Well, thank you for sharing those two classics Pleasure. and retro collectibles. Thank you. I really do appreciate it more than you think. Oh, absolutely, um, man. You'd love the collection. You'd love oh. it. And and also, because obviously you love the Corys as well. So you can imagine I had um, both of them, Corey Feldman and Haim, attached to a horror film called Black Mass, which was an occult thriller, kind of a throwback to Rosemary's Baby and, and The Ninth Gate, very Polanski-esque. Uh, and and it was really, it was going to be, it was a rebirth. It was it was supposed to, it was, it was, it was supposed to be, homage to Lost Boys 
and, okay. and, I was so, and I was so close, Shane, that like Corey was literally flying out to mine on the Monday and we lost yeah. funding on the Friday. Oh, no. It was, it was horrific. And when he died, it was actually my mum's birthday. I'll never forget it. It was the 10th of March. Mm. Yeah, you will so, never forget it. Tragic. But since well, then, it's been interesting because I've made friends with his mother and with a oh, couple good. of girlfriends and, and Feldman and Feldman's agent, who was also Haim's agent. And, uh, yeah, recently, in fact, uh, interviewed someone who had directed one of his films, The Double O Kid, Dee McLaughlin, uh, got some of her anecdotes. So it's it's been interesting. I've, I've, I've felt like he's always kind of in there with me because since then I've just met so many people that uh, have been in his life. So that's been really interesting. Well, if I have any contacts or I hear anything, I'll pass them your way. I mean, License to Drive was something also oh, yeah. that really hit a chord with me. I think I was at that right oh, yeah. age as a, as a kid. I wasn't and old also, enough to drive. <laughs> oh, and also speaking of Jarrett from Monster, he just did a commentary for the new Blu-ray Dream a Little Dream, if you can believe that. Yeah, look, yeah. There's, there's another couple of movies that have been appreciated over time, one and two. Yeah. Mate, yeah. you know what? Speaking of that too, I hope mine are. I hope that mine are appreciated over time because I've felt with even with Lady Terror, uh, I found a new audience. I found guys that really understand the film, yeah, and 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 they're probably of a similar age, and they they understand the the homage aspects to it, and kind of where my head's at. And I yeah. love that because sometimes you make a movie and it doesn't happen. You kind of hit and miss. Yep. And sometimes you make a film, particularly low budget, people don't like it. Um, mm. and, and that's hard when you are, you know, when you're, when you're impressionable and when you want people to like you and they don't, that, you know, sometimes it, it, does, it does hurt. And, I think, and I, I think sometimes people give up. I think sometimes if, it, if it's not, you know, the be all and end all, they'll, they'll just, oh, you know, I did my best and it's not for me. But I've kind of been doing it for so long, it's who I am. So I, I don't, even if they all hated me, I'd probably still keep going. <laughs> Uh, that, I don't think anyone's going to hate you, Nathan. They need to spend five, five minutes talking to you and they're going to like you, that's for sure. Whether they like oh, thanks, you man. or not, your dedication is there. I appreciate, it. I appreciate uh, it. You're welcome. Um, did you ever consider filming this or having it released in black and white? That's a good call, man. Yeah, I think when we did some of those kind of flashbacks with the PI in black and white, you're right. I was in the edit thinking, hmm, this could have been very film noir. Also, Personally, I, guess, I think it would have worked. I think you're right, man. And it's funny because I think of Sin City and yeah. um, also uh, a friend had done uh, a film called Choir Girl in black and white. I did, a, I did an uncredited voiceover in it, but... But looking at that, it was a modern day tale in black and white that was done, um, you know, locally, and that kind of made me think yeah. about that as well. But um, we went for color in the end. I'm not sure why, but uh, but you're right. It could it could have been it could have been. I um I interviewed Chris Devendi for Choir Girl and oh, Roger yeah. and right. Roger. Yeah, yeah. So I know it very well. You know what I'm talking it, about it went under the radar that movie, but um, yeah, I found it online for purchase thankfully because you know when the guys make these films I, I might I like to check in and see who their distro is and Support, make sure yeah. that it, they got it out there uh but yeah it's funny because sometimes I find someone with a movie and because of their I guess their experience if it's not what they wanted oh I'll stick it on YouTube and I'm yeah. thinking man you know like <laughs> There's so many opportunities. It's you know that to me is really a fail. Like there are plate there there are, there are distributors like Ausflix that will yeah. take your movie and put it on a proper platform, and you can get some money. And that's what it's all about. You know, there's so much available now that there never used to be. Just to stick it on YouTube and fail or shelve it is really inexcusable, particularly mm. when you're putting a cast and crew of maybe fifty or a hundred people and their livelihood and maybe a year or two or three of their lives. In, of their in, hard in work, yeah. You just can't do that. It's despicable. And uh, you'll, you'll burn your bridge real quick. No one will ever work with you again, you know. Did, um, did you have one hat or was there a selection of hats? Because you, you, you have a signature hat in the movie. <laughs> the, white, the white cap. Yeah. Yeah, that, I would have bought that specifically for the character. Oh, there you uh, go. And uh, there was a Jason Statham movie I watched where he had a cap the whole time, or maybe it was a cowboy hat. 
and that kind of stayed with me i think <laughs> nice nice yeah. Uh, did did anything scary or unusual happen on set? You know, any any stories? Maybe normally when I make a horror film, because I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> what's the word? When you conjure, <laughs> you got to be careful what you conjure. <laughs> when I'm when I make a horror film, definitely things have happened. Um, saying on uh, the, the the strange game of hide and seek tom boys there were things going on with this one not so much i think probably and if there was didn't notice it because i think we were trying to get it in the can really quickly yeah yep. so we didn't have time to stop and you know look for the ghosts <laughs> good that's good yeah. um, the taylor lakes hotel you know that's a, yeah. that was an actual location you were saying yeah so Adam Ramsey, who plays um, Cornelius, the um, the shaved-headed Egyptian guy, okay, uh, yeah. in real life he's a bodyguard, and he had actually bodyguarded some big names like Michael Jackson, Madonna. Uh, when he reeled off his CV, I was kind of gobsmacked. But he, <laughs> he, he also was a doorman and a bouncer there. So when right. I was looking for bar location, he said, oh, come down to Taylor's. And I was like, oh, bonus. You know, so he actually helped me with some of the locations. So it was, uh, you know, real, very lucky, very lucky. Yeah. Did but interesting, have... going out there, though, then I kind of found the landscape. I thought, oh, this is the, this is where the pulse of the film is. It's a little bit out of city. Right. Yeah, it seemed it. Yeah. So we stayed with that. And so I kept, and then I shot quite a lot around that area. And I said, well, we'll kind of almost stage it in this suburb. Um, yeah, no, I think it worked. Even your office space, which I assume you rented or is your office. Yeah, yeah. No, I rented that one, but it was in a building that I was uh, familiar with. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a good question because locations is such a big part of it. And Yeah, to me they one, are. I agree. Oh, one of my producer friends always uh, praising me for my locations, the fact that every film – looks like it's in a completely different area and he can't believe that I've done 10 films in Melbourne and made it look like 10 different places. You know, it, <laughs> it, 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 that's kind of the skill of it, I think. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good skill, which brings me to, and you've kind of already answered it because you said you've been making films since you were very young. Why yeah. are you a director, actor, filmmaker and writer? Would you be doing anything else or is this what you are destined to do? Every time I've tried to do something else, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, it, uh, definitely in the blood and definitely uh, family that are heavily involved in it. And so I kind of, I don't want to sound cliche, but definitely grew into it. And yeah. I, was a I was a kid that was very lost and sometimes lonely. And it wasn't until I did drama that I was like, oh, oh wow, I kind of, I kind of felt like I'd, I'd I had arrived. And so then I wanted to um, make stories of my own and that's when I amalgamated it. But, but I have artistic roots, you know, because I, I used to paint and, and I've sculpted and drawn. So okay. uh, I reached a point where I wanted those images to move and then I started doing animation, believe it or not, and then, and then I was ready to make film. So it was definitely the, 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 the proper transition from kind of canvas. And actually there's a couple of films I've made where, the first thing I did for the movie was a canvas. So in The Strange Game of Hide and Seek, before I even made the film, I did my portrait. I found the actor I wanted to play, Dr. Jekyll, and I went and got a self-portrait done. Wow. So I started with an actual canvas and I've still got that. Um, I did it in eye portrait as well. And yeah. I'm doing it and I'm doing it again now in another film. So it's it's really um, art emulating art properly, you know. Are you going to be like Quentin Tarantino and stop at 10 movies? <laughs> no. I actually, to be, to be honest with you, I was going to. I was going oh. to. And then, and then I looked at Tarantino's catalogue and because he calls Kill Bill 1 and 2 one film, but it's really that, two films. And, yeah. he's about to do, and he's about to do the film critic. So he's going to be really more at like 11 or 12. Yep. Um, Hitchcock says, you know, don't do more than 12. <laughs> Um, I, I think I'm probably in a, somewhere around there. I think that's okay. a good number. I think that's a good number. I think, you know, if you can make a calendar and have a movie for every month, you, that's incredible. Most people, mm. well, most people can't even do that. I think mm. that would be, a, that, that'd be a good number, you know. Uh, Crystal Yang um, doing the makeup. Yeah. Uh, really impressive because obviously oh. not, not a lot to work with, not a lot of money. Mm. 
but yep. made it just made it happen. Oh, mate, what a what a great compliment! I'm so glad you said that, and I'll tell her and I'll send her this link. She is amazing, man. She was recommended to me by another friend, a makeup artist who I'd worked with, who was booked, and said that she was new to town and was keen, and could I try her out? Which I did, yeah. and she just boom, she's just gone now she's just she's done like three or four features since she's like booked out um and you're absolutely right she's a, she's a wizard she's chinese and uh she's just like a teddy bear i just love her to bits well yeah thanks to your movie lady terry she's on my radar now so i'll be looking for cool. where she's working really wow. yeah, really glad that you got her on set Oh, mate, that's amazing, man. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I definitely highly recommend her and, and love to see her blossom. That's, that's excellent. Now, there's a line that Jake says in the movie that you've been sweeping legs since 84. <laughs> I know exactly what that means. You know what I'm talking about. Well, my sister gave me a present, which was a Cobra Kai coffee mug that says <laughs> sweep the legs since 84, and I, I, I stole from that. But yeah, you're right. I had to put in the homage from Karate Kid. How could I not? It was it was too perfect to the timing. Um, and and <laughs> the other thing too that inspired me was I became friends with Sean Kanan, who plays who plays Mike Barnes, the bad boy in Karate Kid Three. Right. I yeah, became no, friends. Name. I didn't realize. You, yeah. So so Sean Kanan playing uh, Mike Barnes, the bad boy, and uh, became friends with him online during COVID. Believe it or not. And so that kind of influenced me, I think, when in the writing, I thought I've got to throw out some homage to Karate Kid here, you know. Uh, well, it, it, it cracked me up. I thought it was great. I love it. And also, <laughs> you know, having a bit of a martial arts background and having done films like Revenge of the Guaylo, most yeah. of my peers know me for that film. So right. I, I kind of threw that scene in for those fans. Yeah. Uh, those gold bars that appeared in the movie. Uh, yeah. How did you recreate those? Yeah, good question. Originally, it was going to be cash. And then I had this very funny situation where I was in the city and I was in a supermarket and I pulled out a $20 note and the young, actually Asian uh, cashier, she would have been 16, it looked like her first job. She said, what's that? And I said, what? I said, $20 note. She said, what's that? She never said cash. And I thought, wow. That's where we're going. So I thought, well, I can't, I can't do money. In, I can't do it. It's, it's, it's going to be obsolete. So um, then I just thought, oh, I'll introduce the gold bar because you can purchase those as props and, you know, under the right light, they don't look too bad, you know? They look good. Thanks, man. I, I like them too. I thought they looked fine. Yeah. Someone, picked, someone picked on me for um, carrying the suitcase full of gold bars that it would be too heavy. Um, but I don't know. I beg to differ. It just depends on how strong you are. Who cares? <laughs> That's true. It doesn't matter what's in it. If you're strong enough, you can carry it. Yeah, I think so too. And you see it in films all the time, but the suspension of disbelief is, is there as well. And the miss on scene that you're creating, it's, it's a movie. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <You> know. <laughs> uh, look, uh, someone else that, uh, another name that stood out to me, it was Audrey Hepburn. Oh, and, yeah, good call. I mean, honestly, a still photographer and a barmaid, is that correct? Yes. So, I mean, she's name. heavily she's heavily engrossed in it. She loves film and she's got a bit of a knack for stills. I don't know if, if I'd call her professional stills, but she, she, was, she kind of put her hand up. Um, funnily enough, I don't need stills a great deal on set like I used to. In film school, they were like, so you've got to get your stills, you've got to, and I'm like, eh, it right. depends, again, where the movie's going. Like, if, you, if you've packaged it and they just want a poster, quite often I'll do a poster shoot for the movie. Stills yeah. on set becomes more like extra fodder for social media. But I said, well, we need them, so have a go. But she was interesting because her name alone, I thought if I had her name on the cover, that would actually pique people's interest. They would say, Audrey, what, what's, what, is it archive footage? Is it a daughter? Like, it, cre- it creates a conversation. The same way with, um, with Anton, you know, because he looks so much like Danny Trejo. <laughs> he did. And I thought, you know, I could just stick his face on the poster and you would think it's Trejo. So there was Audrey <laughs> and there was Trejo. And it slowly became this kind of exactly what I wanted, which was that kind of exploitation film, you know, right. and... I love the way you, you put it together. Um, I'll finish off before we wrap up with a couple of yep. the cast members. Um, yep. Is it Samay Argento? Yep. 
Shemai, yes. Shemai was a really good choice because I think your movie is full of assorted, unique looking cast. I and, appreciate uh, that. Yeah, it just worked because everyone sort of had their own style. She mm. wears a hat at the desk. I thought that was good. And her <laughs> little, um, her little like twist of how she helps you out. I could see it coming though. I could actually actually cool. pick that. But cool. um, did you know her like just on um, background? Because yeah, she was, she was a great choice. Yeah, she's she's a friend for many years, and uh, much like a lot of the cast that I have, I feel like people that are kind of underused a bit. Sometimes I find these amazing people and and think, gosh, I'd love to see them in more films. And if yeah. if I haven't, I kind of put them in mine. And she's one of those. Um, yeah. But she's uh, a singer, dancer, cosplayer by by roots, and then and then became actor. Yep. Um, and uh, I guess I had her in my back pocket because we, we've been friends for many years. I thought, oh, she'd be perfect for this role. And I, I think even in the writing, she just kind of came into my head. That happens a lot. <laughs> someone will come into my head and, oh, gosh, it's them. So and then sometimes you're waiting. You, may, you, you meet someone you love and it takes years and years and years before you can find a role for them. Yeah. Um, so uh, so it was good for her, too, because she'd come off a lot of extra and featured extra and some bit parts, but she was ready for some dialogue. And so this was a natural transition for her as well. Yeah, well, kind of like in Basic Instinct, Michael Douglas had his his partner, his offsider that was looking out for him for a while, but until... Well, I tell you the one that happened. you'll really, you'll really um, resonate with, it's, it's, the, it's the assistant, if you go back to The Firm, you know, Tom Cruise's The Firm. I haven't seen it for a and, while, but I know it well. So there's an assistant that works for Gary Boosie's character who gets shot, but that woman is almost identical to that character, if you watch oh. The Firm. I'll be going back to the firm now in the next few it's a days. Great film! <laughs> it's a great film, man. Uh, I bet you were friends. Well, maybe not, but you might have been friends with Kimmy, the car dealer. Kimmy, I actually discovered Kimmy. Kimmy and I went year again, a very similar situation where I met this person. And I was like, wow, gobsmacked, because uh, she's one of the only female racing car drivers in the country, in her league, and um, and owns several really hot cars. Yep. And uh, she said to me, you know, Nate, put me in a movie and, and you can use my car. And I went, I'm going to do both. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's got an amazing property out near Dalesford. And I actually sort of kept her in my back pocket. And she came in handy when we did another film that I was co-producing, which is in post-production. Yep. Uh, but she's actually just been on um, Million Dollar Island. She was oh, in the first okay. couple of episodes. So she's kind of popped and she's she's done some really big commercials now. So Again, I guess just with that savvy casting that I have done where I've either discovered someone or knew someone was going to kind of go somewhere. Mm. Um, but, but it's a win-win, you know? She's helping me, I'm helping her, everything. Because, you know, some people use, I don't really use, but what I do is I, 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 I create a win-win situation. Yeah, so, you, don't come, you don't come across as some, someone who would use someone for your advantage you, without yeah, helping no, I mean, them as well. Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely wholehearted in this. It's a passion and I'm definitely it's, in it. It's, to, it's coming out of my camera. Passion, trust me, it's great. <laughs> you legend. I, I love, love talking to people like yourself. Uh, but you do two Appreciate leads. Well, there was sort of three leads, your ex-wife yeah. or ex fiance but yeah. the two girls, the two girls that swindled you. I don't want to give too much away, but I mean, if anyone's, no, that's listening, okay. anyone's no, listening or watching this, they're probably seeing the movie, hopefully. But... Yeah, they yeah. were good choices and they were so different, like in looks, in characteristics. I thought, again, great casting and I love, I like them both. I think very well done. Well, Trisha DeVisha and I, again, we're quite close and I hadn't done a big film with her since Revenge of the Guaylo and I do think she's another actor that's that's not used enough. And uh, to play my wife and to uh, to have that, to have that that stigma we don't mm. have an issue fighting each other on camera we're comfortable so it's mm. really fun because in person her and i are really funny but together we always play <laughs> villains so it's our polar That's opposite great. you know what i mean the chemistry uh, so was there already. with her um but then felita murphy was really the kind of the, the hardest part of the casting and um uh jay harang was picking on me because he was like oh you cast her because she's hot and i said nah I actually cast her, well, she is beautiful, but her, it was her voice. There was a tonal thing to this character. She had mm. to have a specific tone. And when I did the audition, I was waiting, waiting, waiting. And I, oh, and I heard it and, went, and it was her. 
you know, and it was, and that was magical because you go into the casting sometimes feeling like you could fail. You know, you don't know. You just don't know. Tarantino is the same. He just waits. He won't cast the person until the character comes in the room and he yeah, doesn't right. get how long it takes. And I'm, I'm the same principle, absolutely the same principle. Well, in, in, to wrap it up in your own words, uh, your, um, your description of your movie and why should people watch it? Because there is obviously, as we yeah. said, so much to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why should people Question. click on that thumbnail or wait for the, the physical yeah. media maybe? I think the answer is if you're sick of DC and Marvel mm. <laughs> and, you want to, yeah. and, and you want to watch a film where you can relate to the characters and possibly even be the character because I am, I am the every man. I, and, and this is why I like Jason Statham when he came out of the gates because it, oh, was, a balding, so it was a balding guy, middle-aged guy that, that most men could uh, – imagine they could be and mm. and that and that and that's to me is a real hero i love the real heroes so films like drive with ryan gosling where he's a daytime real man's hero there that mm. that's that's my my uh my flavor so yeah if you're sick of sort of seeing guys with capes <laughs> <laughs> this is the film yeah no i totally agree um i think like i said at the top um independent film is pretty important to me so no matter yes of, of its of its genre, of its quality even. You know, some independent movies can be uh, higher budget than others, but then not be as as effective as a lower budget one. So um, that's the yeah. irony. That's the irony because if, if I find an indie film that's done really well, I will in probably enjoy it more and I'll rewatch it. Whereas yeah. if I go in and if I go in and see the new Iron Man, it's going to be once off popcorn and coke. It's fun. I might as well go on a Ferris wheel or a roller coaster. It's a bit of a ride, and yep. I think that's a movie, but a film is different. And I think the differentiation differentiation between film and movie it's two different things and two different yeah, that's, experiences. That, that's a whole other conversation for us, maybe yeah. for another time. Because yeah. I, I I think they got their place. I love blockbusters. Yeah. I mean, I love it's blockbusters. Same. So I also, also like going into that palace cinema or that dendy cinema yeah. and, you know, just watching something that you're just not expecting. Oh, 100%. It's great to go and, and, and like you said, lose yourself in a reading cinema in the middle of the day with some obscure movie yeah. um, and, and come out and it'll stay with you for days. Um, and then, like you said, you know, other people, they'll take the family and they'll go and see the new, the new Marvel film and it's, an, an, it's an adventure and an experience and it's great for kids. Don't get me wrong, it's great for kids. But yeah. as a film connoisseur and as a, as, as a man, um, I think we thirst for a bit more and I like a film where it's a psychological thriller where I have to think. I don't want to be numb and have everything spoon-fed to me. I'm, I'm more intelligent, so I want to have a movie which is probably why I like Basic Instinct so much because you really had to think really hard about like, is she real? Who's the villain? Who's the, what's going on here? You know, and that, mm. that to me is more of an experience. The, and, and David Lynch films, the psychological and the abstractness that uh, pushes your brain um, into areas that you hadn't been before. Mm. So another soundtrack that I've got, the Basic Instinct score. Yeah. Oh, the best um, vinyl. It's a beautifully presented double vinyl. Um, oh, the yeah. movie holds up. I recently rewatched it yeah. for its anniversary, and I'd yeah. seen it plenty of times before, obviously, but not for a while. But it holds mm. up. I love it. It really does, doesn't it? And so yeah. does so does Fatal Attraction, and so does Disclosure. Um, yeah. You know, I haven't get, seen pretty, Disclosure pretty, again for a while. I think anything Michael Douglas is in from like 1980 to 2000 is just an absolute gem. I mean, the game. Like he, he's one of my favorite actors. He, he's phenomenal. His the film, Ghost in the Darkness. Oh man, his film choices were just so spot on. Like, yeah, you know, for for the drama thriller, you know, he he's he's the king. Well, this is the the interviewer and the interviewee chemistry coming alive here. Oh, but yeah. I will say thank you, and uh, I'll stop recording, mate. All right, my buddy. Uh.